At first glance, it may seem that the unremarkable neutron has nothing to surprise us with. It's a simple subatomic particle found in many atomic nuclei and essentially acts as a glue for protons. But what secrets could the neutron be hiding? The neutron, in fact, gets its name because it is neutral. So what could we possibly expect from it? But as it turns out, the neutron is actually very interesting too. And one of the main problems associated with the neutron is the lifetime of a free neutron outside the atomic nucleus. And a lot depends on this parameter. Even though it might seem like that's not the case at all. It turns out that when matter was forming in the early universe, when everything was just coming into being, and there was a strange, bubbling, boiling soup of all sorts of particles, the lifetime of the neutron in its free state directly determined the diversity of matter that was forming at that moment. In one scenario, if the neutron had lived for a certain amount of time, we would have ended up with more hydrogen. In another scenario, since neutrons appear, helium atoms would have already started to form, and this would have fundamentally affected the nature of matter, the nature of the substance that forms in our universe. And this in turn calls into question our correct understanding of physics. So once again, we are discussing a fascinating problem for which there is no straightforward answer. And as long as we have atoms existing in the form we're used to seeing them, as long as the classical nucleus of the atom exists and the neutron remains bound within it, everything is fine. A neutron can exist for a long time without decaying. But if for some reason the neutron is left on its own, its lifetime turns out to be not so long. Most sources state that the half-life of a neutron is 10 minutes and the lifetime of a free neutron is 15 minutes. This is where things get really interesting because some sources list the neutron's half-life as 879 seconds, while others say it's 888. Which value is correct? How should we approach this properly? When a neutron decays, a certain transformation occurs. These particles do not just disappear without a trace. It turns into a proton, an electron, and an antineutrino. All the same conservation laws we've talked about many times still apply. This process is usually called beta decay. Why is it called beta decay? Because an electron is emitted. And here we encounter a certain contradiction. When we look at the structure of the neutron and the proton, we see that they are almost identical. At least that's what it seems at first glance. And naturally, this leads to confusion. Why can one particle exist for many years? Its lifetime often comparable to that of the known universe itself, while the other exists for only about 10 minutes. The trick is that their structures only appear to be the same. Take a closer look. In reality, one of these structures is a combination of quarks of one type, while the other is a combination of quarks of another type. For example, a proton consists of two up quarks and one down quark, while a neutron consists of one up quark and two down quarks. This difference determines how the processes will occur. Now we can confidently say that we need the neutron to turn into a proton, and yes, here I especially want to highlight this transformation of one into the other, because as I notice, people who are only superficially familiar with the topic are often very surprised that a neutron can become a proton. How is that possible? How about from a proton? Why doesn't anything come from a proton then? Why does a proton live so long? And why does something come from a neutron? Well, that's exactly how the model we're discussing works, and there is an explanation for this process. Essentially, for a neutron to turn into a proton, one quark needs to turn into another quark. Again, if we look at the diagram we've seen several times already, we'll see that one down quark needs to turn into an up quark. All right, but how do you do that? And here, another force comes to the rescue. A fundamental force, a fundamental interaction that we've sometimes mentioned briefly in the videos. The weak interaction. The weak interaction exists for this very reason. In fact, I remember someone asking in the comments, why do you talk so little about the weak interaction? and maybe it's not important at all then? Well, my friends, the weak interaction is also a fundamental force. It is absolutely essential for explaining processes like these. Without the weak interaction, one type of matter, or more accurately, we should say substance in these cases, could not transform into another substance. It is precisely thanks to the weak interaction that neutrons turn into protons. It is also due to the weak interaction that these systems can later function in some way and eventually combine with each other. And of course, the weak interaction truly is fundamental. Here, however, things start to get interesting because the weak interaction is described in a surprisingly vague way. And despite the fact that this interaction determines, for example, the possibility of synthesizing certain elements in the cores of stars, we do not fully understand this process. Once again, the explanation is rather superficial. But since we're now talking at a certain general science popular level, we have the right to assume that this perception, this description of the process will be sufficient for our purposes. So as we said, in order to turn a neutron into a proton, in essence, for a neutron to decay, we need one of its down quarks to turn into an up quark, thus replicating the structure of a proton. Uh, and this process is explained through W bosons, 
W bosons, they are called differently in various popular science sources. But, surprisingly, this process, its mechanism, is very similar to other processes we've discussed many times, for example, to the so-called charge exchange reaction. In this case, we have a similar situation. We need the down quark to emit this W boson, and for this W boson essentially to turn into other particles or be released as free energy. And the down quark itself in the process will turn into an up quark. Naturally, you might have a logical question. So why doesn't a proton just turn into a neutron? Why then is the proton so stable while the neutron just falls apart so easily and turns into all sorts of strange things? However, there's nothing fundamentally new in this logic either. Essentially, once again, we're dealing with various forbidden transitions and the law of conservation of energy. Essentially, the stability of the proton is explained by the strength of its configuration. The quark configuration allows this particular combination to be stable. With one combination of quarks, we get a particle that is more than just stable. And with another combination of quarks, we get a particle that is not stable at all. That's how all of this interestingly works. If we recall how quarks are connected, it's through gluon exchange, which is the strong interaction. And this strong interaction works a little differently in each case. And the direction in which processes occur is explained by their favorability. The neutron is slightly heavier than the proton. The internal particle of the neutron is, in total, heavier than that of the proton. That's why it's favorable for the neutron if one of its particles decays. For the proton, this is energetically unfavorable. Essentially, here we are once again applying the same logic that exists throughout physics. The logic of energetic favorability, the principle of least action, and the principle that describes the process of energy transitioning from one form to another. Essentially, we are trying to explain the structure of the atomic nucleus and the behavior of particles within that nucleus using the same approach we used to describe, say, a stone falling from a tower or a transition from one state to another. And yes, the proton also contains a down quark. Yes, you could say that it was advantageous for one to transform and not advantageous for the other, because in the proton, the down quark sits. If you imagine these energy levels we're talking about as a kind of ladder, the down quark in the proton actually sits on the lowest rung. Sorry for the tautology, but in the neutron, this down quark ends up higher. Therefore, recalling the interaction we're describing and the equivalence of mass and energy, we have to assume that if such a transformation were to occur in the proton, we would need to get some extra mass from somewhere. But we don't have any extra mass like that. And in order for it to appear, some energy needs to be supplied. In the case of the neutron, we do have this extra mass. And since the energy levels of the particles inside the neutron are distributed differently, it's favorable for the down quark inside the neutron to decay. For the down quark inside the proton, decaying is not favorable. In practice, that's exactly what we observe. In practice, we see that the neutron turns out to be unstable, while the proton is more than stable. And everything else follows logically. When the neutron starts to decay, all these interactions begin to break down. A certain amount of energy is released in the form of one particle or another. We remember the equivalence of mass and energy, and as a result, the neutron eventually decays. As a result, we are left with a stable configuration in the form of a proton, along with additional particles and extra energy that have been released from this whole system. The next reasonable question you might ask is, why don't neutrons decay inside the atomic nucleus? Why, as long as neutrons are bound with protons and all of this forms an atomic nucleus, don't we observe any interesting anomalies like that? Why, for example, doesn't neutron decay start happening in helium? Well, again, it all comes down to the very structure we talked about earlier. As long as neutrons are evenly distributed inside the atomic nucleus, they are in a bound state. And a bound state is not something trivial, it's not like just pouring marbles into a basket. It's a completely different story. A bound state is a constant energetic exchange of virtual particles or even regular particles between the components. And as long as there are protons nearby, as long as the strong interaction is constantly occurring between them, this strong interaction largely holds the neutrons themselves in place as well. Neutrons act as a kind of buffer or damper, without which, on the one hand, the existence of large atomic nuclei, heavy atomic nuclei, would be impossible, and on the other hand, it's hard to imagine that a neutron within this structure could simply fall apart. Now you might say, well, that's all well and good. There are models, there are mathematical approaches, there are perspectives you've just described. So why can't physics give a definitive answer as to how long a neutron will live? And how do we even deal with this? The thing is, we do have models, we do have processes, and they even seem to be confirmed by various experiments, but actually measuring the lifetime of a free neutron is practically impossible. In other words, the experimental data we have allows us to observe how a neutron decays. It more or less allows us to detect that certain processes occur during neutron decay. At the very least, it's highly likely that this is exactly how it happens. But as for the neutron's lifetime, we can't really measure it properly. 
If you measure the lifetime of a neutron caught in a general stream, it comes out to 888 seconds. But if you measure the lifetime of a neutron trapped in a trap, it's 879 seconds. So it turns out that, as always, we've uncovered something interesting and, as always, found out that things aren't so straightforward. And that even a simple particle, which seems completely straightforward, behaves in totally unexpected ways. But I hope you found it interesting. I hope you learned something new for yourself. Here we talk about physics, about its fascinating behavior, and about all sorts of philosophical questions related to physics.